Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on this conference. I'm very sorry not to be able to meet you in person. My name is Anna Sechini. I'm an archaeogeneticist working in this field since 2008. I did my PhD in Mainz, Germany, and now I'm heading an archaeogenetic laboratory and institute in Hungary in Budapest. I will give you today a review paper on the achievements and concepts of archaeogenetics regarding the prehistory of Western Asia. This is an intro to our field. Phylogenetics or archaeogenetics can have many focuses, not just humans. My scholar fellows um, deal not only with human remains, but can gain nowadays genetic information from different types of specimens, even from Chugam here, uh, to reconstruct ancient biodiversity diet microbiome of people, or they can also analyze ancient pathogens, then can also be um, uh, retained from mass graves, like here on the image, or genetic material of extinct animals, or even traces of occupation of megafauna or, or uh, presence of megafauna uh, signs in the cave sediment can be recovered uh, via ancient DNA. However, in samples coming from your region, the sample preservation is especially problematic due to high uh, summer temperature. And we found mostly less uh, well-preserved uh, DNA material uh, among many uh, environmental DNA and uh, also uh, contaminating contamination is present and uh, challenges uh, our uh, research. What we do in Budapest is pretty similar uh, as uh, it's done in uh, every uh, ancient DNA laboratory where next generation sequencing techniques are applied. After DNA extraction, DNA libraries are constructed, um, DNA strengths are repaired or uh, modified, and depending on DNA preservation, either a DNA capture or um, shotgun sequencing is applied. Um, this is followed by bioinformatics, population genetic and phylogenetic analysis, depending on the, on the target material and the qu research questions we have. Now we turn toward ancient genomes gained from humans in this talk, and my expertise uh, mainly covers this field of archaeogenetics. The number of available ancient genomes is radically increasing during the last couple of years. You can also check these on this web page easily. Mm, which also shows you that the prehistory is especially very researched in Europe. And besides Europe, more and more data come from Western Asia as well. Now let's begin our journey to the past. Most people are familiar with the traditional out of Africa um, model. Mm, modern humans evolved in Africa and then dispersed across Asia and re reached Australia about uh, uh, 60,000 years ago. However, technological advances in DNA analysis comparing ancient hominin um, with Homo sapiens and fossil data put an emphasis on the new model, which is about multiple dispersal of uh, modern humans out of Africa, beginning as early as at least 200,000 years ago. So nowadays we think that modern humans left Africa several times and that they interbred with other hominins like Neanderthals, Denisovans, in many locations across Eurasia. Either, either this or that way, Western Asia had a um, crucial role in this dispersal, served as a crossway and probably also as a genetic hub at the time of the Paleolithic era. The scientific concept of uh, Bazar Eurasian genetic lineage is the signature of ancient non-African Homo sapiens who di diverged from the common European and Eastern Asian pool before genetic pool before 50,000 years ago. So prior to the introgression of Neanderthal genome into modern humans, which introgression is traceable up to now in our genomes, by the way. This lineage, so the better European, however, Eurasian, however, uh, has significant contribution to later European populations, like you see it here on this admixture graph from Lazaridis um, et al. Uh, 2014. The geographic location of this population group is still a matter of discussion, with the higher proportions found in ancient samples from the Caucasus Mountains, Levant, and Iran. And um, 
it still peaks in modern day Middle East and Western Asia and also uh, detectable uh, in Iran. Last year, a new paper by Valini et al. reinterpreted the currently available palo paleolithic genetic data and postulated the Western Eurasia as a long-term hub for human populations. Homo sapiens lived after the, the 60,000 years old out of Africa event in this region. And this hub and period was characterized by multiple events of expansion and local extinction. Origin of all Eurasians can be traced back to at least four migration flows from this hub, according to this model. And here I think analysis and new specimens from Western Asia will have a crucial um, role again in the history. Now, I would like to go into the details a little bit more and show you the current situation of research and knowledge on the genetic history of Iran, Western Asia. Here is a periodization for those who are not familiar with the chronological terms and archaeological terms. I must, must say that these dates are very approximate and cultural changes and chronological phases connected to them are shifted from region to region. Therefore, um, scholars mean different chronology behind the same terms, like Neolithic, for example. I will mostly speak about Neolithic and the Metal Ages in the followings. The Fertile Crescent here indicated on the map with red, also including the Zagros regions, the Zagros mountains, was uh, the cradle of Neolithization in Western Asia and in Europe, which brought agriculture and settled lifestyle um, to the people. We already have a couple of ancient genomes from Iran, published in the last six to seven years. So let's see, what do they tell us about prehistory? In uh, 2016, Lazaridis and his colleagues published a paper on the topic of farming in Western Asia. These included samples from the Neolithic period of uh, site Ganjdare and Kalkolithic site Stenshikapi. They uh, experienced the genetic uniqueness of the Iranian Neolithic population. And basically, this gave a new corner on the genetic map, which we which we described with very complicated graphs like this here. Lazaridis and colleagues began to draw this connection system between many hunter-gatherers and early farmer populations based on allele sharing frequencies of these ancient genotypes. This original picture has become completed through the years. So let's move on to the next uh, level, which was another paper from the Harvard team focusing on Central Asia. 50 new ancient genomes are published here from Iran, and the region is also placed in a Eurasian-wide connection system. I must emphasize here the UNESCO World Heritage Site, Shah Rezukhte from Eastern Iran, that yield an interesting result. I will come back to that later on. The third important, oh, sorry, the third important contribution came in 2022, which is a series of papers actually divided by temporal packages of a large new data set all appeared at once in the Journal of Science. Among 727 genomes, 35 are new from Iran in this paper. Here, many previously published genomes are also enhanced by uh, new analysis. And here I need to mention sites like Sechkapi again, Dinka Tepe and Hassan Lu from the Iron Age with large DNA data sets from Iran. I plotted on this map what we have ancient genomes today from Iran, circa 110 published samples, most of them from the Zagros region or from north of Iran. One single site from the east is the mentioned uh, Shah Zohte. As you see on this schematic image, this graphical abstract of the, our latest paper, there are, hun are hunter-gatherers, paleolithic genetic components listed on the frame of the map, and these can be defined as, ed as edges on our landscape. And the mixture of these components show various clients in the later prehistoric populations of the area. The Iranian hunter-gatherers and early farmers were the most similar to hunter-gatherers in the Caucasus. So we can add here, blue circle, <laughs> the Ganjdara population shares this ancestry with the Caucasus hunter-gatherers. And this ancestry level is 
define all inland populations that is of North, northern Zagros, Armenia, Azerbaijan, as well as those of North Mesopotamia. The main research question is here, how this pattern got changed and became more colorful through time. I indicated that mixture components on this map, following the chronology of the region. Seven components were considered in an unsupervised, unsupervised way in my uh, admixture analysis. The Neolithic Gangstera population shows a clean, clear picture. The small extra components we see in these diagrams can be attributed to differences in the laboratory processing of the sample set. It shows the long-term isolation of Western Iran from Anatolia before the Neolithic. The dating of the split of the ancestries in the region is still not solved, I think. Uh, still not solved, I think. Although attempt has been made um, based on single and, and less well uh, preserved, less well covered uh, genomes. In the Calcolithic, South Asian client is postulated where the two dominant genetic components are that of the Anatolian farmers and the Iranian Neolithic farmers. This cline is observable on our actual data from Iran as well, as we see more Iranian basis, basis in Tepehisar in the, in the northeast and less Iranian um, basis in the northwest. In the latest paper, the role of Mesopotamia was further investigated along its connections to Levant, Anatolia and Iran. On this plot, we see, uh, this is a triangle plot, we see a three-way model of admixture between populations tested by F-statistics. We have Iranian Neolithic, Levantine Neolithic, and Epipaleolithic in Northwest Anatolia as three source components. We see how other populations of this area can be explained with these three sources. Their mixture builds a genetic continuum in this region, in these Neolithic times. Then in the Bronze Age, dramatic changes happened. New step components appear in the North and also new Southeast Asian signals are recovered in the East at the site Shah Zohta. What were the population movements behind these uh, new signals? This is basically described by Minara Simhan and his colleagues, first as uh, consequences of the migration of the Yamnaya people from the steppe, Around 3000 BCE, a large scale migration started, which reached Bactria around 2000 BCE and Svet Valley around 1000 BCE. The Yamnaya migration has also major consequences on the European Bronze Age population, and this effect is having its consequences still in the present day genetic diversity of Europe, especially in Northern Europe. During the Bronze Age around 2000 BCE, the Turan population gained Yamnaya components, and the Turan-Iran interaction began at this time as well. The other important process is related to the peopling of South Asia. Here, the population of Iran is again an important factor. First, Iranian farming population disseminated probably around 7,000 years ago to the east, or it might have happened earlier, as Shindan colleagues claimed. This was the basis uh, of the Indus periphery population, we can say. The second pulse is the entry of the Eurasian steppe people from Central Asia into India, carrying Central Asian genetic markers. This mixing with the existing ancestral South Indian population uh, created the ancestral North Indian population. This happened in the first half of the second millennium BC, without detectable traces in the material culture so far. On the figure in the left on the plot, you see how these genetic lines can be represented by F-statistics and how they show the genetic flow between Central and South Asia. The mutual connection to the Indus, uh, Indus Valley civilization is seen in a subset of samples of Sahra Zohta from Eastern Iran. Some individuals from here are on the genetic line from the Indus Valley civilization. The outliers, the Shahrizohta and also Gonor Tepe in Turkmenistan, Bronze Age Turkmenistan, imply gene flow from South Asia into these regions. 
from the Iron Age, we only have data uh, from uh, the northwest area of Iran. We see the steppe influence at this time, uh, also showed in yellow. Um, and uh, the new newly reported data revealed that a large proportion of individuals in Armenia and northwest Iran belong to a specific R1B Y chromosomal hypergroup during the second and the first millennium BC, providing a genetic link with the Yamnaya population in the region where no archaeological presence of the Yamnaya culture itself is attested. Now I would like to come back to this image, which also contains some indirect information on the connection of uh, genetic diversity to language families and their supposed homelands. The latest genetic evidence-based theory uh, are the followings. Proto-Indo-Anatolian, so including both Anatolian and Indo-European languages, was formed in the Caucasus hunter-gatherer rich population, south of the Caucasus or south of the Caucasus, and might have spread into Anatolia in the Chalcolithic. Proto-Indo-European languages were formed on the steppe and spread from there to Europe and also to Asia, I mean here um, the carriers of the Trocarian language. Proto-Indo-Iranian might spread to South Asia through the steppe as well, and not from or across Iran, according to Narasimhan and his colleagues. However, there are still some contradictions here. If we compare the genetic splits with linguistic calculations, that place, for example, the most recent common ancestor of Indo-European languages to circa 8,000 years ago, so way much earlier, uh, what would correspond to the step hypothesis. Johannes Krauss has solved this uh, with the explanation that still Iran was the homeland of Proto-Indo-European languages just way before the Yamnaya culture in the Neolithic times. It can be explained because Yamnaya people has Iranian-like Caucasus hunter-gatherer ancestry and Eastern European component in their genome, as it's shown on, on this map. Still, genetic results cannot correspond to linguistic pattern in, in, in Western Asia due to lack of ancient DNA data and also sometimes, and of course, uh, linguistic records, and also sometimes these results have completely different patterns to, um, to the linguistic ones. So genetics and linguistic records are not corresponding. So these are not the final words on this topic, just some aspects and prospects of ancient DNA studies I wanted to share with you. To move on, we initiated together with the Iranian partners the genetic research of the Parthians. Um, my colleague Motahar Amjadi will talk about these preliminary results um, today. And uh, I, I have some key points, summary of my talk. Western Asia was a genetic hub in the Paleolithic era. Neolithic population of Ganjdara has a local origins and serve as a reference point for many comparative analyses. It's very important for us. Genetic influence of uh, Anatolian populations has declined in Southwest Asia, so observable in Iran. Then uh, dramatic changes happen in the Bronze Age with the Yamnaya or Steppe people also in Iran. And uh, the Proto-Indo-European homeland question is still debated, likely was in the Steppe, but precursor languages might originate it from Iran. In Europe and India, uh, mixtures of people with step pastoralist related admixture in their genome and those without um, is observable. So this mixture is observable. They also drive modern uh, ancestry lines. Here are the references. Um, we still have a lot um, to research in Western Asia, and I hope that more prehistoric data in the future will contribute to our understanding on the history of uh, both from cultural and linguistical aspects, very important uh, area of uh, Eurasia. Thank you very much for your time, for your attention, and uh, greetings for Budapest. Have a nice conference. Goodbye.